Um, this paper is an exploratory one. It's not particularly academic. Um, it's just an exploration of, of ideas um, and uh, thoughts. So positive action. One thing that I should clarify right from the beginning is that Nursi's positive action shouldn't be confused with this late 20th century social orthodoxy known as positive thinking. If you visit any bookshop in the UK, um, for example, you'll find shelf after shelf of self-help books, many of them advocating the notion of positive thinking. The writer Karen Armstrong um, tells a story of a man she met at a conference. Um, they were chatting and he said, if you have true faith, you can't suffer. Um, now, to an extent, I understand where that sentiment comes from, but I still can't help but feel that this is the lazy way out. Um, faith shouldn't be an opiate. The opium of the people, as Marx said, most perceptively. But to hear some people talk, faith is seen as something that would be able to numb even the pains of a concentration camp. Think positively, we are told, and everything will be fine, everything will be well. Well, I don't really think so. And in any case, isn't faith, and Islam in particular, supposed to make us see the world as it is? We're supposed to see the dunya kama here. Now, this positive thinking message becomes particularly toxic when it's used by governments as an anesthetic, the anesthesia of positivity, alongside all of the other forms of social control employed to keep the people in a state of drugged insensibility to what is really going on in the world out there. But in our global world, which can be accessed at the press of a social media button, we can no longer afford to ignore the voices of the oppressed, or as Karen Armstrong puts it, to edit out the misery in people's lives. In the past, for example, my own government in the UK has pursued policies that have resulted in great suffering telling us that we need to think positively as they bomb Baghdad. Think positively, we'll try not to kill people, um, and everything will be well. Well, we've let conflicts continue until they have become humanitarian disasters. And of course, today in Western Europe, we are reaping the reward of our heedlessness as the pain that we've tended to ignore in so many parts of the world has turned into this murderous rage. So I just wanted to separate um, this Western social orthodoxy of positive thinking from Ustad Nursi's principle of positive action, because they're very different. So what does it mean to say that an action is positive? Well, if we consider the conceptual framework within which this term has evolved, and my framework here is the Risale Nur, it is a framework of worshipfulness, or ubudiyah. It means acting in accordance with the precepts of divine wisdom and not on the basis of personal desire. In other words, it is informed action. It means acting for the sake of the creator and not for the sake of the self. In other words, it is directed action. It means acting in accordance with Quranic principles rather than secular directives. In other words, it is grounded action. So, Positive action means acting in a way that's informed by divine wisdom, grounded in the principles of the Quran, and directed towards deepening our sense of communion with the Creator. Now, nothing is done for his sake, actually. It's all done for our own sake, because he needs nothing from us. We, on the other hand, need everything from him. And positive action is an acknowledgement of this. Um, so we can see, therefore, that positive action is not actually a method, as most have portrayed it. It's a methodology. A method is a single tool. A methodology is the whole toolkit. Traditionally, as I said, positive action in the Nursian context has been linked specifically with the issue of metaphorical jihad, manavi jihad. But I see positivity in most, if not all, of the concepts, views, and approaches which we find in the Rasul nur Let me elaborate. Human beings are meaning-making beings. We are beings who are given innately to hermeneutical thinking. 
Language is the tool that we use, which allows us to think and to communicate symbolically. It allows us to read, it allows us to interpret. When the prophet was told to read, and I had a conversation about this this morning with two people, which was very interesting. When the prophet was told to read, Iqra, he was in fact told to interpret. So to be born into this world is to be thrown into this vast maelstrom of signs and symbols that have to be interpreted. We have to make sense of them. Now, those who are unable to make sense of the world, or those who are unwilling to make sense of the world, are doomed to live in a life either of alienation or of abject cognitive um, confusion and intellectual servitude. How do we escape that fate? Well, that depends on whether we are able to think ontologically, which is what the very first revelation to the Prophet was about. Now, for the vast majority of people on earth, ontological thinking is not something that is deemed worthy of consideration, at least not to any great degree. If there is existential angst in people, um, it's usually a juvenile phase. It's something that happens in your teenage years. Um, and as children grow up, the questions that children ask are usually either ignored or subverted. Mothers and fathers all the time can be heard telling their children, stop asking so many questions. I hear this all the time, in supermarkets especially. The secular education system, and don't think that the Muslim world doesn't have a secular education system, because it does, serves to answer the questions in accordance with the dominant social narrative. And of course, we know that the default setting of secular society is um, obviously secularity and also materialism, naturalism, scientific materialism, and so on. And the vast masses of the largely unthinking world don't know what they actually believe until they are told what they believe. Their faith is usually in science or other scientism, scientific progress, technological progress, materialism, and so on. And those who find themselves hungry for something other um, than this staple fare of secular materialism are usually pushed towards the increasingly non-conformist religion of spirituality without religion. You will find people all the time saying, I'm very spiritual, but I'm not religious. Um, and in this sort of bubble, they're able to explore their innate and inexplicable desire for transcendence by tasting and testing various expressions of faith. Others gravitate towards um, one or more of the highly secularized world religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, which have all become secularized. And if they end up as Muslims, they end up highly secularized with a personal, private religion that stops as soon as they enter the street, as soon as they close their door behind then when they go out in the morning, their religion um, stays in the house with them. Now, the fact that ontological thinking is so highly valued by the Quran is borne out by the large number of verses which tell us that we must, must make tafakkur, tadabur, ta'aqol. We have to reflect, we have to deliberate, we have to reason. No other religion, no other faith places such a high value on these three cognitive functions, reflection, reasoning, and deliberation. And it's from ontology that epistemology emerges, and it's from epistemology that we derive a moral system, which determines and regulates our behaviors as believers. So ontology, asking these existential questions, epistemology, knowing the answers and getting the answers from revelation, morality and action. These four poles are the poles upon which a Muslim believer's life in this world and in the next are built. Now, Nursi paints a very simple picture, actually, of the epistemological choices open to human beings. Before us, there are two paths, the line of philosophy and the line of prophethood. One is the line of philosophy, which derives knowledge and meaning from the world by means of the use of reason. 
and revelation. Uh, sorry, the line of philosophy derives knowledge from the world solely by the use of, of reason. The other is the line of prophethood, which derives knowledge and meaning from the world by means of both reason and revelation. Now, morality for unregenerate man, for secular man, for man who is not interested in asking the big existential questions, is arrived at by the use of reason guided by social and personal interest. Secular morality takes from revelation only those things that are of social and personal utility. For secular morality is highly instrumentalist, it's consequentialist, it's geared towards the attainment of personal and social benefit, whether or not revelation is in agreement. Behaviors are determined and regulated by morality, which is largely laissez-faire, anything goes. And as time progresses, the dependence of behaviors on the moral system is overturned, as increasingly behavior itself begins to determine morality. So moral codes are broken and eventually morality is actually molded in accordance with behaviors that have been sanctioned by the majority. So it's actually a sort of overturning of the system. In the Islamic system, in the Islamic thought system, we have our ontology, which is first, which determines our epistemology, and epistemology determines our morality and moral or value system, and that determines our behavior. In the secular system, that's slightly different. And we've reached the point now um, in the secular world, in the secular milieu, where behavior is actually determining values. And um, one pertinent example, of course, is the issue of homosexual acts between consenting adults, another is same-sex marriage. And it's arguably a sign of the breakdown of morality when behaviors, instead of being determined by the value system, um, actually act as determinants of the value system. Now, it's clear that the secular view is predicated on negativity. This is where the notion of positive action as a infrastructure, if you will, as a methodology comes into play. Unregenerate secular system is predicated on negativity. You only have to look at the ontological basis of modernity to understand this. And of course, it is modernity which Nursi was writing about. The whole of the Risale and Nur is a reaction to the encroachment of rapacious modernity. Modernity is the realm of Adam, or non-existence. Nursi talks with great insight about the drivers of unbelief. One is Adam Qabul, or the non-existence of acceptance. And this describes the vast majority of those who describe themselves as unbelievers. Their unbelief inheres simply in their failure to accept. Adam Qabul. Most fail to accept because to use a ubiquitous justification, I've never really given it much thought. So most unbelievers are that kind of unbeliever. It is a kind of Adam Qabul. And if you press them, most of the Adam Qabul denomination are agnostic rather than atheists. They say, we can't know that there's a God, uh, so I'm not going to ask any questions about it. The other driver of unbelief, the key driver, is qabul adam, or acceptance of non-existence. This describes the small but increasingly vocal minority of what may be described as fundamentalist atheists. Um, they go to great lengths to advertise their unbelief. Some of them are very adept at proselytizing, at spreading their unbelief. They've made names for themselves. Um, they could even be described as professional atheists. I'm thinking of Richard Dawkins, I'm thinking of Lawrence Krauss, I'm thinking of a whole host of sort of celebrity atheists in the States and Europe. There is a negativity at the heart of secular ontology, the absence of God. And when we have the absence of God, we have the absence of any kind of absolute arbiter or criterion by virtue of the existence of which a fail-safe epistemology, a healthy value system, and a wholesome set of behavioral norms may be postulated. That means that the epistemology, the value system, and the behaviors of secular man 
will also be largely negative in tone and tenor, however positive they are made to seem. However much positive thinking is done, the underlying principles are negative. The underlying tone, if you will, is negativity. Now, Nurse's positivity is a positivity of worldview. It's an ontology which focuses on existence, the existence of a recognizable ground of being, rather than non-existence. It's an epistemology which is founded on the safe and secure ground of revelation and is mediated by reason. Reason is not the, the main driver here. Rather than an epistemology which is hesitant, which is tentative, and founded um, as it is on the shifting sands of human reason unaided by revelation. A value system which derives its value from the will of the creator rather than the desire of the created. A set of behavioral norms which seek to make us whole rather than to make us fragmented. So positive action, and this is the end now, um, is Harikat uh, Muspet is, is, or Muspet Harikat is not a method. It's not a strategy that is, is employed at a particular time um, as a reactive response to a particular event or a situation, although clearly that's how it's been um, usually explained. My argument is that for Nursi, positivity underpins his ontology, it underpins his epistemology, his value system, and his behavioral system, um, or the behaviors that he advocates. All of this is undergirded by positivity, by existence, by acceptance of existence. So positive, positive action for Said Nursi, as I understand it, and as I said, this paper is just ideas and thoughts. Positive action for Said Nursi, I think, is a methodology and not a method. Um, thank you very much. That's the end. Okay.